One of the challenges about the way Jesus often spoke and taught is that he told stories. And what the story says to you might not be anything like what it says to me. Even the learned folks who have gone to school for a long time and earned degrees in an attempt to understand these stories often can't agree on what he's trying to say. Today's story in particular seems to have many possible angles of interpretation. At face value and viewed through the lens of our modern economic times, we might even think Jesus is taking the side of the 1%, saying the rich are going to get even richer and the poor poorer, and that's the way it ought to be. But that sort of application of his words certainly would not be consistent with the overwhelming evidence we have in Scripture of Jesus having a heart for the poor and a stern warning for the wealthy. I think we can safely say this parable is not about money or economics. Maybe the open-ended nature of Jesus' stories have a purpose in that he left us these stories so that the Holy Spirit can work through the stories and say what we need to hear at the time. Maybe it's okay that sometimes the message I get out of the story and the message you get out of the story are not identical. All week long I've been living with this story, reading what others have to say about it, listening to our men's Bible study grapple with it, having many different thoughts about this story. But I keep coming back to one word, afraid. I was afraid. I even found myself noticing this week when I used that word, afraid. Are you ever afraid? Afraid for yourself? Afraid for others? Afraid for the world? I have to tell a story on Jan Vestal this morning. About three weeks ago, and we're so glad Jan is back. About three weeks ago, Jan told me on a Monday that she would not be here for the next couple, three weeks. She was going to the beach, driving alone to Edisto. She said, I just need some time alone. I had to ask her, you mean you're driving four hours by yourself? Staying alone in a house? Yes, she said. I don't remember if I actually said it or if I just thought it, but I wondered, do your daughters know that you're doing it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And before I spoke, she answered my question. She said, I am not afraid. That's a lit. Over this week, I reflected back upon my own life. You know, what we think of ourselves is often established early in life. I guess I've never seen myself as particularly courageous. In many ways, I was a cautious child, and cautious children can be both a blessing and a pain. <laughs> I learned how to swim just enough to save myself if I was ever drowning, but I never would jump in, jump in or dive into the deep end on purpose. I don't like being where my feet can't touch bottom and my head stay above the water. <laughs> when some of my friends in seminary took up skydiving and asked me to go, I said, no way. <laughs> Am I ever jumping out of a plane? I want to keep gravity my friend, not my enemy. About the third month that Jean and I were married, one afternoon I came home from work. She was home. There stretched out across the front sidewalk into the house was a four-foot snake. 
I thought, well, here's my chance to prove I'm a man. <laughs> I let the neighbor take care of it. <laughs> now, I have to say, I will stomp on a cockroach with Jean screaming in the background. One of the things, as a side note here, one of the things that has confounded me about my sweet wife is that she'll go into a dark house to make an arrest with a Glock strapped to her side, but a cockroach caught on its back with its little legs flailing sends her over the edge. <laughs> so if you're ever on her caseload, I guess the way to get beyond her is to carry a few dead cockroaches in your pocket. <laughs> are you ever afraid? Now some of you are afraid to do what I'm doing right now. Stand up and speak before a group. Strangely enough, God sometimes chose people with just such a fear to be his public spokespersons. God had a cruel sense of humor. Remember Moses, proclaimed Israel's greatest leader, had a stuttering problem, didn't want to talk before people, didn't seem to matter to God. God would not take no for an answer. Remember Jonah, Jonah afraid to be a leader. He knew the job was too hard for him. People would not go along with him. And he didn't much like the people anyway. And Jonah ran from God. And God would not take no for an answer. And after a little trip through the digestive tract of a big fish, Jonah said, well, okay. <laughs> Remember Peter, Mr. Big Talk? Wanted others to think he was fearless, but when it got right down to it at the moment of truth, he gave in to his fears. He could not make it all the way across the water to Jesus, could he? And in the hour of great Jesus' greatest need, he could not keep from turning his back on Jesus before the rooster crowed three times. What causes us to be afraid? What are we afraid of? Oh, I know we all have particular lists of fears, phobias, we call them, snakes and cockroaches and spiders and heights and all that. But there's some common big categories. Two of them come to my mind. Afraid of rejection. Afraid of failure. The third servant in our story this morning appears to be under the grip of both of these. Now, some of you may sympathize with this third servant. After all, he only has one talent, and what if he lost it? Where would he be then? When we perceive our lives to be in a condition of scarcity, it naturally follows that we become more determined to hang on to and to hold firmly the little that we think we have, and we live as if we are afraid. We live under the grip of fear, and we get defensive. It is a condition, strangely enough, which seems to lay claim upon Christians, of all people, Christians living in this great land of plenty. I don't know about you, but it seems to me there is a lot of Christian defensiveness being practiced, a sense among Christians that we're in a condition of scarcity and that we have to hold on tightly to our little one piece of the pie lest it be taken from us. Sometimes we say we're defending God and God's kingdom against the Muslims and the Buddhists and the atheists. And sometimes it appears that we're trying to defend our little piece of God's kingdom from each other and every other Christian group who thinks differently from us. Now let me say, without question, there are those in this world and in this great land of plenty that we live who struggle to find the basic material necessities of life, while others possess more than they can find places to store it all in. And the reasons for, for having not enough or having more than enough are sometimes self-inflicted, self-induced, and sometimes they're imposed by others, and sometimes they're beyond anyone's control. But remember, this story of Jesus is not at its heart about economics. Or money. For in the story, all three of the servants are provided a measure, while different, in the end, all three are given more than ample to meet their needs. 
The story, at its heart, is really about their relationship to the Master. Amen. It's about how they see the Master. It's about what they believe about the Master and how they live among the Master. The third servant lets it be known he's afraid. In the 24th verse, Now the one who'd received one valuable coin came and said, Master, I know that you are a hard man. Your har you harvest grain where you haven't sown. You gather crops where you haven't spread seeds. So I was afraid of you. And I hid my valuable coin in the ground. Here, have what is yours. See us. Lewis, who's a well-known Christian writer and theologian of the 20th century, wrote a series of children's books called The Chronicles of Narnia, three of which have been made into movies. You may have seen them. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Prince Caspian, or The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Near the end of C.S. Lewis' Chronicles of Narnia, Aslan, the lion, who is the Christ figure in the story, takes the children, Lucy, Edmund, Peter, and everyone to the new Narnia, to what we would call heaven or the new creation. And it is a place of astonishing light and beauty. It's a place where every blade of grass seems to mean more and where every creature sings for the sheer joy of the Creator. It's a place where everything is just so real in depth and in, and in color that the mere sight of a daisy takes your breath away and makes you weep for the sheer beauty of the thing. But there, then, in the midst of all this splendor, the children see a group of dwarves huddled together, convinced that they are sitting, the dwarves are, they're convinced that they're sitting in the rat stench of a barn, a place so dark they cannot see their hands in front of their faces. Lucy is so upset that the dwarves are not enjoying the new Narnia that she begs Aslan the lion to help them see what was all around them. And Aslan replies, Dearest Lucy, I will show you what I can do and what I cannot do. Aslan then shakes his golden mane and a sumptuous banquet instantly appears in front of the dwarves. Each dwarf is given a, a plate that's just heaped with juicy meats and glistening vegetables and plumps of grain of rice. And each also receives a goblet brimming with the finest wine anyone could ever imagine. But when the dwarves dive in and begin eating, they start gagging and complaining. Doesn't this beat all, they lament. Not only are we in this stinking stable, but now we've got to eat hay and dried cow dung as well. And when they sip the wine, they sputter. And look at this, dirty water out of a donkey's trough. <laughs> the dwarves, Aslan goes on to say, had chosen suspicion instead of trust and love. They were prisoners of their own minds. They could not see Aslan's gift of the new Narnia, for they would not see it. Aslan can but leave them alone to the hell of their own devising. The question is asked, might something similar be going on with the third servant in this parable? Could it be that, that he just could not see the goodness of his master, choosing fear and suspicion over hope and joy, thinking he had so little to give back to the master and the work of his kingdom, he returned that which he had been given instead of investing it and potentially multiplying it. <coughs> the truth is that God is accustomed to working wonders, almost miracles, with little one-talent people who have enough faith in God and in themselves to do significant things. Amen. One commentator on this passage says, tear the halos off the heroes and saints of the past. Take a look at them before we put halos on them, and you will see. You'll see men like Moses, who was a man with blood on his hands. He murdered an Egyptian, remember? And as we said before, he had a stammering tongue. 
Think back to James and John, those loud-mouthed fishermen trying to badger Jesus into giving them special seats in heaven. Think about Peter, blundering hulk of a man, widely known for making promises he could not keep. Think about Paul. He was an unimpressive little Pharisee determined to persecute every little Christian that crossed his path. Stand them up without their halos, and you see them as just little one-talent men whom God took and twisted their talent into something incredibly significant. To the point that today, we call them saints. The choice before us is one of being a reluctant servant or a risky servant. Yet we live in fear. Fear that we will fail, fear that we will be rejected, and so we live small, and we live cautious, and we live withdrawn. And the thought may come, well, preacher, you don't know what I've been through. I've got hurts, and I've got guilt, and I've got pain in my life, and I'm just trying my best to keep it all contained inside. And if I risk opening up my life to God and opening my heart to give of myself to others, that all could come flooding out. be one who's ready to put his healing hand upon you. Are you trapped this morning in fear? Fear that you have so little to sustain yourself materially or emotionally. Fear that if you put what you have out there, you will be rejected. Fear that if you try, you will fail. Are you trapped in those fears? And have you wrestled with the notion, I just, I just might as well give up? Have you ever felt like giving up? Have you ever wondered, even in what you try to do for God, whether it's doing any good? We never know. One more story. <coughs> This time about a little girl named Annie, who in the year 1876 was 10 years of age. Annie was put into a poor house for children called the Tewksbury Alms House in Massachusetts. Her mother had died and her father had deserted her. Her aunt and her uncle found her too difficult to handle. She had a bad disposition, she had a violent temper, stemming in part from eyes that had been afflicted with a painful trachoma, an eye condition. She had been put in the poorhouse because, you see, no one wanted her. She was such a wild little child that at times she had to be tied down. But there was another inmate in that poorhouse named Maggie who cared for Annie. Maggie talked to her, fed her, and even though Annie would throw her food on the floor, cursing and rebelling with every ounce of her being, Maggie, who was a Christian, out of her conviction, she was determined that she was going to love this dirty, unkempt, spiteful, unloving little girl. And it wasn't easy. But slowly, it got through to Annie that she was not, she was not the only one who was suffering. For Maggie also had been abandoned, and gradually Annie began to respond. Well, Maggie told Annie about a school for the blind, and Annie began to beg to be sent there, and finally consent was given, and she went to the Perkins Institute. After a series of operations, Annie's sight was partially restored, and she was able to finish her schooling and graduate at age 20. Having been blind so long, she told the director of Perkins that she wanted to work with the blind and with difficult children. So they found Annie, a little girl, seven years old, in Alabama, who was blind and deaf from the age of two. So Annie Sullivan went to Tuscumbia, Tuscumbia Alabama, to unlock the door. 
Helen Keller's dark prison and to set her free. Remember that story? One human being in the name of Christ helping another human being. That's how God's kingdom comes. Through small acts of kindness. But we can only do those acts of kindness if we can live as if we are not afraid. Only if we can live trusting that God is good enough to give us what we need and through us bless the world around us. Can we live this morning as if we are not afraid? I don't know yet what it is about this place that we are. But this cautious kid standing before you here today has never in his life felt so unafraid. Like my sister Jan, starting this new church with lots of unknowns, I am not afraid. A church who at the core is to be a place where all people are welcome and a place where we are all asked to leave our prejudices and our judgments and our long-held convictions about who's acceptable to God and who's not and what the Bible says about that. We are asked to leave all of that at the door before we come in and come in here to love God. where we are this morning. And I am not afraid. More than ever in my life, I am living as if I am not afraid. What about you? That's where I'm at. And I'm amazed every day at what God is doing here in this place. might your testimony be the words of Jan? I am not afraid. Let's pray together. So often we are like the third servant, Lord. So often in our lives we have lived small and cautious and closed and withdrawn. And, and it's all because of fear. And yet in your word, somewhere in your word, we are told that perfect love casts out fear. And so we gather here this morning not afraid because this place is filled 